The road to space isn't paved with technology and rockets alone. It's built on the dreams, risk, and relentless spirit of those who dare look up and say, we belong there. For over 30 years, the Space Frontier Foundation has been a home for these visionary, radical, action-oriented individuals. Hear their stories, learn how space was shaped, and revel in the revolution of commercial space pioneers. Welcome once again to our series about commercial space pioneers, and it is my pleasure today to be talking with the one and only Jess Bonable. Uh, I have had the pleasure of working for Jess, but even though I spent a lot of time trying to make sure he and his team were happy with the work that I was doing, there's a lot about Jess's background and history that I didn't know and still don't know. So we're going to get into that today. And thanks, Jess, for, for being here. Really appreciate it. There have been a number of people that have mentioned this program called the DCX, sometimes Delta Clipper, sometimes DCXA. Let's start with the 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 end, and then we're going to go all the way back into the beginning. Uh, what's the short summary of what DCX was and what its impact has been? So DCX was a test vehicle, a vertical takeoff and landing, rocket power, four very complex LOX hydrogen engines, and it took off and landed vertically. It did the uh, rotation maneuver that you saw SpaceX do so dramatically in recent years in 1996 or five, long time ago. Um, and so, so this was, this was a, a rocket that landed just like in the sci-fi things, right? Yeah, it was uh, in the news big time back in the mid nineties. We flew it from 1993 to 1996. Uh, and it was uh, a real challenge keeping money flowing to it. Uh, it was a very different kind of program and that there wasn't a lot of money. It was $67 million spent the first flight, which in that era was absolute peanuts. Uh, I, I see DCX as it demonstrated a lot of the technologies and the uh, operations concepts needed for today's modern reusable launch systems. And a lot right, of that so data was provided to uh, Elon Musk at SpaceX and Jeff Bezos teams and other teams that are doing VTOL rockets today and so not uh, just not just inspiration but actual like data they, they they took our data and they went so far beyond what we did it's like a light years of difference so <laughs> they did a great job but rocket lab which has a fair amount of money stoke now. base and uh, relativity all have significant money and and all of them are pursuing this VTOL rocket and, and if you look at the industry as a whole today uh, probably 98% of the money going into commercial space launch is coming is coming out of those companies. So the world we exist in today traces a lot of its success back to this program that you managed. And we're going to be talking about the program. We're going to be talking about what the Space Frontier Foundation had to do with it. Um, so that's just a, a little bit of a, a hint of what's to come. Take Take us back, if if you would. So a lot of this this series is about the the journey of the individuals like yourself that helped create the world that we live in today. So were you a space nut from the earliest ages, or did you just get assigned into working on space? What what's your earliest memory of your interest in space? No, can... I, w I was a space cadet from my very earliest ages. Uh, yeah, I uh, love sci-fi, read up, but I was also very technical, you know, physics degrees and math. So I, uh, I had a realistic perspective on that. So in high school, I wanted to grow up and, and build uh, vehicles that I could go out to the asteroid belt and mine them. Then I got into the real world and suddenly realized that we were still launching uh, <clears throat> expendable launch vehicles that cost tens to hundreds of millions of dollars every time we flew them. And uh, we hadn't even tried to upgrade our technology in 50 years. And so, okay, so uh, take, take me back to high school Jess. Yeah. Today, if someone says, hey, I want to go mine asteroids today, someone watching this who's telling their 
friends, hey, I'm going to go mine asteroids, they might get, okay, you're a bit aggressive. That's kind of weird. But like, did you tell people that this was your idea when you were in high school? Oh, absolutely not. I'm not an idiot. No. <laughs> I will. But, mm. but I always thought no, it was no, a good idea. No judgment on anyone else who answers that. Yes, I did. But but you did not tell your no. friends this. What was that but like? I, like, But I did, you know, apply to the United States Air Force Academy, and I went and suffered through four very difficult years, graduated with a degree in physics. And if you could have offered minors in astrodynamics, I would have got it because I had a lot of astro as well. And uh, later I picked up an advanced degree in astro. So I kind of positioned myself to go after this whole new market. How did you get to asteroid mining? Because like you didn't have the expanse to say, oh yeah, I saw that TV show. (laughs) Like, was there something in Star Trek... Or... Uh, it, was, uh, it was science fiction books, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, you know, all okay. of that. That was uh, Andre Norton, uh, all, all of the science fiction classics that are out there. And, so, and um, you read that and you thought, sure, let's do that. Well, yeah, I mean, physics is physics. It, it was all, well, other than the interstellar stuff, it was <laughs> all there. In that era, the space shuttle was being developed I remember uh, being braced at a table uh, at the academy, which is what we always were, was braced. (laughs) And uh, uh, telling an upperclassman about, you know, how uh, the space shuttle would be able to carry a Greyhound bus to orbit and would turn around in 24 hours and fly routinely and bring the cost of access way down. None of that happened. Not because it couldn't happen, but because bureaucracies are not good at the living, operable, reliable, safe stuff. And uh, and they still aren't. So we go to the moon and then yeah. we leave the moon. And then there is a period of time in the seventies where, was, was there any human space flight? I guess there was some Skylab stuff, but like, so before, before the shuttle is flying. Yeah, there was a gap there after Apollo, you know, which was ended in the early 70s. And uh, and then the space shuttle picked up in the uh, in the early 80s. Now, did you believe what you were saying to that upperclassman when you said it? I I, like everyone else. Of course, we're going to pull this off. But, you know, the the reality is it's uh, it's hard to do. There wasn't ever quite enough money to do it the way, you know, the bureaucracy was used to doing it in the past. And shortcuts were unacceptable in that area. So the kind of development act progress that Elon Musk has uh, pioneered was just not allowed in a bureaucratic environment. (laughs) And, and that's one of the new things that we brought in with DCX is we did use a very different, uh, very non-bureaucratic process to just go build and fly things. But but I have to say, within a giant bureaucracy, you know, there's a dollar limit to how how much people will tolerate that. And even yeah. at the limit we were at, which was 60 or 70. You believe in this space future. Um, right. You didn't talk about it publicly. When you got to the academy, were you talking, you were defending yeah, the shuttle, but like, were you still, were, did you have any peers was, or were you just? I, I was just describing the potential, Sean. Okay. And for that, I got a special dessert, you know? So I was happy at that time with my defense of the of the space shuttle. Absolutely. Were you finding other like mind? like were there other people that were like, yeah, he's on to it? Or were you still kind of like, even, even in the academy, well, it, were you finding other like-minded folks or were you still kind of way off? Um, most okay. of us at the Academy wanted to grow up and fly fighters or bombers or aircraft. And uh, there's always a number of folks and some of my classmates as well who grew up and did all of that, but then ended up moving over to NASA as NASA astronaut. In the Academy, how does it work coming out? Like where you go in well, the Air so Force? I, I got out. Um, I, before I got out, I... Uh, took a drive uh, down to Vandenberg Air Force Base, and uh, I interviewed with them and said, hey, I'd really like to come to work for you. And they said, well, we don't really use physicists, we use engineers, um, and say, well, I can still do engineering stuff. So so anyway, (laughs) they hired me and found a a slot to put me in, and I ended up working on global positioning systems. So I was the launch controller for Navstar's uh, three, four, five, and six, and then I left to go back and get an advanced degree. Navstar 7 uh, went into a mountaintop, so, you know, I left at the right time. Of course, <laughs> if I'd been there, I wouldn't have gone into a mountaintop, but, you know, that's, uh, 
That's uh, kind of the story of my early years uh, coming up. And, and really the formative years, I, I, uh, I got picked up for a program, payload specialist program on shuttle. There were like 35 of us uh, in the Air Force at the time. Only two of us ever flew, but it was a great program. I learned a lot. And, and then uh, I ended up moving on to the National Aerospace Plane Program. And NASP was trying to build a single stage to orbit air breathing rocket air breathing and rocket system that would uh, provide aircraft like access to space. So that's really where I came up with, uh, hey, this is possible. And, you know, the real conclusions out of NASP was it is possible, but it's not possible the way they were doing it. So, <laughs> so the, the real answer was we had a program going on the side called HAV Region, which was an all rocket program. And the goal of that program was to have an operational capability by 1991 but no money, no Buck Rogers. So yeah. it was so, never funded. But what I did is I took the results of that program to uh, SDIO. And so my, Mike Griffin and Gary Payton got quite interested in it. Uh, about the same time, there was a group out of uh, LA, the Citizens Advisory Council for Space, led by Jerry Pornell, the science fiction mm -hmm. writer. And uh, Jerry and a group of uh, misfits in his basement had come up with this idea that, you know, you could build a vertical takeoff and landing rocket and uh, and you could do it very low cost. And so he took it Wait, to the vice president at the time. Did you know this before it went to the vice president? Like, were you one of the ones in the basement? I was not one of the ones in the basement. Okay. I am. I you're, I you're in the Air Force. Careful. Okay. <laughs> so, no, no, and, and, and like understanding, so you wanted to... You saw the the value of space. You get to work on GPS, which is awesome. Yeah. At that point, when you're working on GPS, did you feel like tough to do? Like, if you go back and imagine, what was your view of space? Like, did you feel like when you're doing this GPS thing that this was a military project, or did you think that this was something that might have broader impact, or like? So, I mean, you got to put it in context of the era. Okay. Yes. So. Uh, I'm sitting there in the, this is just a few years later in the GPS SPO down in Los Angeles, the joint program office, and uh, they bring around a uh, army man pack demonstrator, right? So what that is, it's a 40 pound electronic pack on your back that gets a GPS signal and tells the army guy, you know, where you're located. That wasn't really commercial, okay? So no. what really <laughs> revolutionized was the rapidity with which we downsized all of those electronics and then introduced them. And actually, we introduced them in the commercial sector before we introduced them in the uh, military. We all knew there were commercial applications and it would be a big deal, but at least I never envisioned GPS would be what it is today. Okay, so there was not a... Um you're doing this job because GPS is going to lead to commercial mining or like, like it's, <clears throat> and I, I don't mean to like zero in on the commercial mining, but like, you know, as a young professional, you're doing the work they're handing to you, but you're also getting to work on something that's the real love. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable about satellite systems, but the, the real love I had was for launch systems and okay. reusable launch systems in particular. And, okay, so and I, after seeing what Jerry Pornell and crowd put together, I agreed that a vertical takeoff and landing system using rockets made a lot of sense. And, and it wasn't the first time the idea had been proposed. It's been proposed all the way back to the 1960s. Nobody's ever, uh, you know, carried it to the next level. So, all right. So in this uh, Jerry Purnell in his basement. What time frame are we in here? We're in 90, 90s? Uh, yeah, about 1989. Okay. Maybe 90. And, it, and uh, where is the shuttle in its development and flight regime? Oh, so oh, we have flying in what, 81, I think? Yeah. Or 80, somewhere in there. They had a steady less than 10 flights a year over most of its uh, career. So. Yeah. And we already had the. Challenger disaster and return to flight by then, right? So we're in the 90s, we, we've got the shuttle is flying and that, in case anyone's not aware, took off vertically and then was a horizontal land. Yeah, there was 
very little understanding in the bureaucracy that you could take a rocket powered vehicle and fly it with aircraft like operability characteristics. And what I mean by that is it's reliable, it's maintainable, it's supportable, it's ava available. And, and in particular, you can turn it around quickly. So when you design aircraft to turn around quickly, what that means is they're reliable, maintainable, supportable, available. All of the illities are built in with that one parameter. So that's what you have to do if you want aircraft like and low cost access to space is you got to design them that way from the get go. And, and Starship and, will be the first to do and that. And we don't mean physically turn your trajectory. We mean once it's on the ground, get it ready for the next one. That's exactly right. And again, part of what we're doing here is making sure that we help clarify some of that language. Okay, so you got a crazy sci-fi writer guy who's got something partway through your military career, right? Because military folks, were you planning on doing 20 years or were you just yeah, around. somewhere about that point, uh, I had pretty much made up my mind to finish off the 20 years and, and punch, and that's what I ended up doing. Okay. But uh, at that point, you know, joining them, I was, uh, well, I was 15 years into my career when I went to SDIO to pick up and manage the DCX program. For folks that aren't familiar with that 20-year military service, there is a cliff a retirement cliff that happens at, if you get 20 years of service and so once you get that certain point you're like yeah i want to stick it out what's the like is there a risk like career wise once you're 15 years in what is your objective career wise well it, it's always nice to get to the 20 and have a, a retirement stipend for the rest of your life it's not a big stipend but you know it's uh, not insignificant either I was motivated to uh, to reach that goal. I will always watched my personal career and uh, and tried to make sure I was taking care of my family, all those I love as well. So um, let me let me ask the in, indelicate question then. Sure. Why would you risk your military retirement at 15 years in? Why would you? The worst thing would happen would be like getting asked to leave at 17 or 18 years, right? Because then you miss out on the whole thing. So how the heck they, did they, you they don't, Unless you get court-martialed, they don't do that, Sean. I mean, okay, you got to do something. And there are people who do it and get away with it. But, you know, I never did anything court-martialable. So okay. I was now, threatened a few times, but never actually. Uh... <laughs> you were pretty much set that you were going to be done and out. So you weren't necessarily worrying about... The, the your paper and promotion and like chasing higher sure I, I guess the concerns came a little later as dcx started being successful and flying and and all of a sudden congressional ads start showing up and here i yeah. am this poor young major and letters come in with 40 congressional and senator uh signatures on it telling the secretary of defense to get off his ass and do something to fix launch look over here at this program so it wasn't a particularly career enhancing move but you're kind of at the tip of the spear at that point, yeah. and you got a lot of people pushing for you, and uh, you do your best to kind of, you know, ride that Bronco. And also, you got a team behind you that's building and flying hardware. So, you know, you can't turn your back on them either. If you knew how rough that ride was going to be. I, I got out at 20 years. In fact, I got, I put my paperwork in before I ever came up for colonel, full colonel. I was a lieutenant colonel. Yeah. I uh, don't regret that in the least, but making full kernel would have been a nicer thing to do. But I put my paperwork in before uh, that even was an option. So I, I was always worried because DCX got so much visibility in the press and so much visibility in the political scene. And, and because we were getting these massive congressional ads telling the DOD to get their act together, you know, I was always... Uh, kind of concerned that uh, this is going to backfire on me at some point. And I really did not want to be a Billy Mitchell that left the service uh, involuntarily. I don't know Billy Mitchell. So Billy Mitchell was the guy in the 1930s who was a, a brigadier general in the Army Air Corps who said, we don't need battleships anymore. We can sink them with airplanes. And ah. uh, as you can imagine, the U.S. Navy did not appreciate it. So they set up a demo, the Navy laughing and giggling and said, you can't sink a battleship. Go sink that one. So he went out and sunk. And uh, 
and of course he got court-martialed in the end. Uh, but but at any rate, uh, he was right. Okay, and yep. uh, as a result, the Navy slowly switched their focus away from battleships and to aircraft carriers. All right. So, and this is, I think, really this is an important thing because. I'm not prior service, but I'm the people that are serving the country may not always have the ability to like take on some risky things, but that's good that you were, you were aware and you were concerned. So that's like, know that it might have some, some implications. I, I, I love my air force career. I got every assignment I ever asked for. And I worked every one of them with general officers in advance and, you know, people liked me and I got along fine with everyone. Uh, but, you know, politics makes for strange bedfellows, and you do have to be careful. Yeah, amen. All right, so I keep going back to the basement. What else? So in your um, in that your military career up until this point, when you were are we working, were you stationed at Vandenberg? I was. Okay. That was my first assignment. Okay, so what else? You know, you were focused on the launch aspect of the GPS, Right. So everyone else is paying attention to the GPS. You're looking at the launch going, hey, that needs to be fixed. What else was going on in the space, like space community? Like, and I know there were a lot of different um, grassroots organizations and things like that. Were you aware of them? Were they? Sure, I, were they I was aware of the L5 Society, uh, which later became the National Space Society. And I was a yeah. member, in fact. Okay. And I was aware of, you know, the Department of Energy and NASA studies on solar power satellites. And I, uh, you know, read up on them and tried to keep myself current. But but mainly I was an Air Force officer uh, pursuing, uh, you know, the, the launch program. And later I, uh, I transitioned to get an advanced degree at AFIT. And then I transitioned back to L.A. where I was in the, G, uh, the JPO for uh, GPS as well. So I spent the first 10 years of my 20 years in the Air Force working on GPS. Okay. Uh, AFIT and JPO? A joint program office for the deployment of the global positioning system in the Air Force Institute of Technology. There you go. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of acronyms. <laughs> All right. So I think we've gotten a pretty good idea of like what leads to this, this idea, this DCX idea when you hear about this advocacy work that's going on, what was your, at that point you were working on the, um, what was the program that was before you did before DCX? Um, that was the national aerospace plane program. Okay. Uh, the idea was that you could take off horizontally with a uh, low speed cycle and then transfer transition to a ramjet transition to a scramjet and eventually go to a rocket and get all the way to orbit with a very small vehicle. Turns out the physics don't support it. There was a lot of issues there that we ran into, but we did mature in today's dollars, over $5 billion of technology, and okay. that was a, a great help. But you know the disadvantage is once NASP was killed in 1995, all money for any kind of next generation space launch flatly just disappeared out of the Air Force budgets. So- Was that because the program wasn't successful or? You know, there's a number of reasons, but a lot of our, uh, uh, a, a lot of the innovation in the Air Force was in the Strategic Air Command. The Strategic Air Command, which was behind all this next generation global reach space planes, was the primary command and the 800 pound gorilla that wanted to go do this. And, and we killed the Strategic Air Command in 1992 or three. And when we uh, dissolved mm -hmm. that command, basically the fighter pilots took over. Would you attribute that to be one of the kernels of separation of an Air Force and a Space Force? No, I'm, I'm not sure. That came really later. Um, okay. But in a way it was because uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, support to go do, you know, advanced technology, next generation solutions anymore. It just evaporated. And so basically it was first generation fighter, second generation, and we're up to sixth generation fighter. And those fighters, we can pound the shit out of Mexico and Canada, but anywhere else in the world, we have to be invited in to fight. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not a good 21st century solution. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, you hear about this thing. What can you tell us about did you get a call and said, hey, Jess, we want you to be on this DCX program? Or like, what was the 
formulation of it? How did it come to be? And did you have a, a hand in the formation of the program? No, I, I, uh, I, I, I did go up and brief to have region results to um, Mike Griffin, who was the director of technology at that time. Okay, and, have, uh, have region was a... That was the, ro the rocket program that was right. trying to build a, a, an Earth to orbit launch system. It was almost, but not quite, a single stage to orbit capability. Okay. And, and that and wasn't it, public, it's, right? it's very reminiscent of what Elon's doing. It wasn't okay. vertical takeoff and landing, it was horizontal takeoff and landing. So they used crazy things like sleds and other things, but it, it, there was a lot of history there as to why they did all that. But the point was they built structures that validated right. that you could build really lightweight structures, just like Elon is doing today. Okay. And then Mike Griffin, who later on in this space story shows up couple different places, but at this point, what is he doing? Well, he's the director of technology at the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. Okay. And and yes, I told him about it, and then uh, I went off to school for a year, and then I uh, begged them to let me come back and work on the program. So they brought me back in to uh, uh, to support the, the fledgling program that became DCX. So did, did Jerry's bunch of sci-fi hoodlums yes hoodlums like how did they manage did they did they get dcx planet like how did how did the so DCX they, they, uh, they put together a concept uh called spaceship experimental kind of put it out there in a white paper and uh the aerospace corporation i was at the nas program at the time the aerospace corporation took a look at it says ah, just somewhat credible you know you could potentially do this so they took it to high frontier and uh, they were the ones pushing uh, ballistic missile defense capabilities. Danny Graham, Lieutenant General, retired U.S. Army, took it to the vice president. And the vice president sent a note down to uh, Ambassador, whoever was the director of SDIO, General Monaghan, I think, at the time. And uh, they wanted to go do this uh, and take a look at it at least. So they put a little bit of money aside. Not a ton. You know, we had a lot of money where we kind of put a... Uh, into crazy ideas, and this was one of them. And so they uh, allocated 60, 70 million and said, see if you can make this work. Okay, so let me ask an SDI question. Sure. Wasn't SDI the thing that was referred to as Star Wars, or is that a different thing? Because there was the Reagan Star Wars that, you know, as and legend has it. That's exactly what it was. It was a program initiated by President Reagan to. Uh, basically uh, um, ensure that we could defend ourselves against uh, ballistic missiles that are shot at the United States. And later in the early 1990s, it was defanged a little bit. And it was okay. really uh, um, more of a program at that point to protect overseas troops and okay. but not so much the mainland. You know, so if somebody shoots nukes at us today, we're all dead meat. If you happen to be to pull forward deployed somewhere, <laughs> you have a chance of survival. So. All right, and, and so and this is this is good because I like making these connections. SDI in public parlance is one of the things that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union because they couldn't keep up with us. And this is one of those negotiating things. So it has that whole broader history, but then it still is existing, and that's where this DCX concept gets sent for, hey, we should we should do this. And could you literally just go call up the vice president and get a meeting with him or her? Or is that like? Well, I certainly couldn't. And uh, you probably <laughs> can't. But, uh, you, you know, apparently, uh, and, and Jerry was not able to at that time either. But going to Danny Graham, who's ran, running the High Frontier Society, former Lieutenant General, he got a meeting without a problem. So right. they went over, and this is all independent of me, and, uh, you know, talked to the Vice President about, hey, we could go do this. We could change the way we do space access. And obviously, Vice Presidents don't know. It's not that they don't know anything, but, you know, this is way it's outside the, the norm. Yeah. So he sent a note down to uh, SDIO, and the reason you send it to SDIO is there's not a lot of places in the federal bureaucracy where you have <laughs> mad money, you know, where you yeah. go through something different. So he asked them and uh, they took a look at it and said, you know, this isn't totally crazy. And about that time I showed up and said, hey, we've actually done some work on single stage to orbit rockets. You know, you might actually be able to pull this off if you design it right. All right. So 
all right, so now we got the program starting. Are there antibodies yet? Like at this point, this is a concept and it's in this SDIO. Yeah, and there... the show was a, for the first year, it was a study. I was off at Air Command and Staff College. Uh, so for that first year, it was just a study with, uh, you know, four major primes and they were looking at this. And this is really before the era of commercial space, okay? So oh, yeah. they, they uh, took a look at it. They all had different solutions. They all thought it was potentially feasible. And in fact, they all thought it was feasible. <laughs> But, you know, the cost estimates to make it into a reality were on the order of, you know, five, ten billion dollars. So, which is small by airplane investment standards, sure. but, you know, to take this step and go do this would be tough. So, what we ended up doing at SDIO is doing an experiment, right? A, a vertical takeoff and landing flight concept that hope was that we could use it and the data we learned from it to take the next step and actually build an operational system. Okay, so it's now your project. When it's your project, what does that mean? Like you're the government's project manager or program manager, or what was your what was your? Yeah, I'm the government program manager. You know, at that point, <laughs> your job, if you're doing it right, is to make sure industry has money on schedule and time. Also, to make sure that they deliver on schedule and time, and to you know monitor the program. So when I got there in uh, early '91. We, uh, I sat in on the source selection and we picked uh, the McDonnell Douglas team to go build the DCX. And uh, when we told everyone else, we love your ideas, but we're not going to fund you right now. Uh, and, and that, just to clarify, that was, they had already made the decision to go with the scaled down version to do it like experimental. Absolutely. Yeah, th there was no option. There wasn't enough money in the budget. Now today it might be different perspective, but uh, in that era, there's nobody believed that we could build a, you know, a reusable flight system of any kind for the kind of money we were talking about. And so, do you think the proposals that you got, were they uh, aspirational? Like, and, and No, they, you, were, they were pretty credible. I mean, with okay. real hard data out of half region for most of them saying they could go do this. So Boeing okay. came in with their uh, sled launched RAS-V, which they'd been pushing for over a decade. And... Uh, and uh, McDonnell Douglas came in with their vertical takeoff and landing Delta Clipper. Uh, Rockwell came in with a, a more classic vertical takeoff horizontal landing vehicle. And General Dynamics came in with a really novel configuration, which was a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, but it entered base first. Yeah, it's a little like Stoke Space today. It's okay. kind of where they're, where they're going. Uh, and, and that really has the potential to be a very, very lightweight solution. You've got a contractor on board. Your job is now to oversee, make sure that things are running and people have the money. What happens as you get into the, the program and who else are you working with? Well, you know, then the politics start rearing their heads and all of a sudden somebody says, you're trying to do single stage orbit. Are you crazy? That's impossible. And I can't tell you the number of PhDs that insist that single stage to orbit is impossible. They have no clue. They never built any hardware. But they don't know what's possible or not. And even Elon, if you look at his vehicles, they're single stage orbit capable with the right engine on them. It's uh, he, he's got amazingly lightweight structures that he's built. Just amazing what? lightweight structures. Why is single stage to orbit um, such a hot topic? I mean, I'm. I, I'm I asking, couldn't be. I know. <laughs> you know, even when we were doing it, although we were talking about a demonstrator for single stage flight. You know, there was always an understanding that we could put two stages on it, just like Stoke Space is talking about, yeah. and just like Elon does. Uh, it's easy to back off to two stages, and there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Once you carry a much bigger payload, a more commercially useful payload. But for the military applications, smaller payloads are actually probably better. <laughs> but I mean, the whole argument of two stage, or, in fact, I wrote an AIAA paper and the title of it was two stage or not two stage. <laughs> um, and, and there's a lot of uh, pros and cons on both sides. Uh, uh, it's all a red herring. That's not so, the issue. The issue is aircraft-like operability. Can I turn it around yeah. quickly? Can I fly routinely just like aircraft? So the um, scientists or engineers or armchair philosophers that want to say, oh, single stage to orbit can't work. Do they matter? Like, 
okay, there's always going to be people that are going to tell you. Because you got the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, the Defense Studies Board. You got all these boards of people with lots of credentials, but very little experience that yeah. are telling and advising the government. And remember, the people that make the decisions often aren't the people in uniform. You know, the, the money is controlled tightly by the political leadership of both parties when they are in charge. So you're running down a path with one party, all of a sudden a new party in charge, you're running down another path. And so when you do that switch every four years, it is tremendously inefficient. And that is one of the reasons why the Chinese are absolutely kicking our ass on many technological fronts today. Were these mm, minders of the taxpayer money? Were, like, were, were you seeing the antibodies because just the, the system is set up for it? Or were there actual reasons to not want to do DCX? No, I, I mean... Uh, Machiavelli, he said, uh, the hardest thing to ever do is something that's new, okay? And, and so you have all the people in the system that benefit from the way it's been done in the past. They don't yep. want you to succeed. And then you've got other people in the system that want to do it differently. And so no matter what you try and do, when it's something new, they go after you. And to take you back to the global positioning system, uh, when we were briefing that for the early acquisition boards, the entire Air Force, SAC, TAC, all of them were dead set against pursuing GPS. They all voted no, it's not worth the money. The only two organizations that said we want GPS was the Navy submariners and the Navy SEALs. It got funded by Congress, barely. And so we got into the demo system and then we eventually had a, uh, a program. It's not always, if you wanna know about how to fight wars in the future, sometimes you're best off not asking people who fought wars in the past. Yeah, there's a tension here. Cause on one hand, you've got the antibodies in the system that say, here's the way things are done. This is how we be efficient. Yep. On the other hand, you're also, you're challenging not only the way things are done, but you're also saying, hey, I'm drawing from actual, some actual experience. Like there has been, there have been programs that have been done. So it's not just, yes, it can be done different, but you're also standing on learning. It's not just, hey, the world should be different. Well, sure. So, so I mean, uh, <laughs> fundamentally, we don't want to talk a lot about military applications and missions, but nope. yeah, let yeah. me just say there's very few missions that airplanes do that today that can't be done better from or near space. Um, okay. But that depends on one important factor, aircraft-like operations, rapid yep. turnaround, all of those features. So, so that's the key that you got to go prove. And that was the focus of the DCX program to prove that. And we knew that if we could do that also, there would be tremendous commercial applications that would come out. Okay, so now you're having some success. You're starting to get the antibodies. You're starting to get challenges. You're starting to get letters showing up. How did you survive this? Were you just... Well, we, we had an organization of SDIO behind us. And, uh, okay. you know, we'd get a congressional query. And, you know, it, it was a very small, non-bureaucratic organization at that time. But at that time, I walked down the hall to legislative liaison and said, I need to talk to this guy. And... You know, the next day we'd be in a, a car heading over to the hill and we would go chat with them and explain to them what we were doing. And, and we had a rational story. I mean, it was uh, it was an experiment. We were off trying to prove it. So so we uh, slowly got support. We did have some problems where some folks inside the bureaucracy tried to kill the money. And 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 then we got Congress to reinstate it. And, and uh, you know, so we had that. Uh, now we start flying. And that's really when it started to get challenging because we would fly two or three times and we'd run out of money. And even though there was a congressional ad of 105 million over four years telling us to fly, 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 we couldn't get them to release the money. They absolutely flipped off, flipped the bird at Congress every time uh, they got money. And the Department of Defense would come down and say, I'm not doing it. You're not, you, you can't tell me. And of course they can't. It's the law. You have to do what Congress appropriates money for, but they didn't. Okay. So, uh, 
it, it was, uh, that's when it started to get kind of nasty, I guess is the way to put it. But we worked our way through it step by step, and we'd get a little bit of the money released, just enough to keep flying just a little bit. So we only flew 12 times over three years. We could have flown 100 times over three years had they let us, but they did not. So how did uh, the National Space Society, the Space Frontier Foundation, the you know, the, these these uh, enthusiasts who are supportive, how did they enter into this discussion? So as we got close to flight, you know, people got pretty excited and they wanted it to happen. And once we flew, man, everyone wanted it to happen. And we had op-eds showing up all over the place. We showed up in the national news. Uh, uh, a senior executive service buddy of mine came down and said, who's your publicist? Who's getting you all this press? Uh, so, uh, did you want the press? Like, well, like, was it, good? And, was there a choice? I, I mean, it was there. No, uh, no, and not, the it wasn't your choice. You know, the, the press is how, you know, for us, the only way ahead was to get that press and to try to yeah. get a follow on program initiated. Okay. Okay. And, and what we had was uh, general officers in the structure as well as SES doing everything they could to keep that from happening. So, so that was kind of powerful people. I, for example, DCX. I, I was not allowed to get an X designation for the vehicle because the AQS space people on the air staff did not want me to have one because they were afraid of the publicity it would give me. So I couldn't go get a X, you know, 30 one or two or whatever the number was at that time. I could not get that designation at that time. It was not allowed. So we just used DCX. Hold on. There's a oh, go figure. There's a structure about what name things are allowed to be called. Yeah. And oh, they, there's a regulation. Yeah, on on getting a next designation, it's easy to do. Managed out of Michigan, you just send them a letter and say, yeah, any captain or major can do it. But we weren't allowed. Not you. We we were not, not allowed yeah. to. We, uh, there was true fear that uh, that that we would get in the way of the, their plans to continue launching expendable launch vehicles for the next two centuries. Okay, so there's some bureaucracy organized against you. There's some um, SES, our career, like the senior executive, like these are the senior folks in the government. You got generals, which sound like they're pretty senior. You got all yeah. these folks that are kind of against it. How did how did the 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 community outside of the program so we had, we had a lot of support outside of you know the the leadership and sdio was good they kept pushing us along as well at one point they finally did after ambassador cooper left uh, they they kind of gave up on it and uh, said it's got to go somewhere else so so the way that ended up happening was dan graham who was a nasa administrator at the time we were flying uh, he was seeing all the press we're getting, and he said, I want some too. <laughs> so he uh, he actually picked up some money from NASA and sent it to us to keep us flying. In spite of the fact that we had money in the DOD budget, it's just that our okay. leadership wouldn't release it. Yeah. And uh, and so then about that time, did. that letter I told you about earlier with 40 yeah. signatures from congressmen and senators, Democrats and Republicans, it was a bipartisan issue, came in to the Secretary of Defense and said, hey, Tell us how you're going to move ahead on space launch. You know, you got this great successful program down here and you're still launching Atlas and Delta launch vehicles from the 1950s. Uh, they set up the space launch modernization panel. They brought in uh, uh, Tom Mormon, a, a lieutenant general at the time, to run that study. We brought in NASA and the National Reconnaissance Office and a bunch of others. The conclusion was 100 percent political. Said, so, well, uh, Dan Goldman, you're interested in this, so we'll get reusables to NASA, and we'll go do a new Atlas and Delta <laughs> that'll launch for, launch for the next 200 years. And so that, that Atlas and Delta was supposed to reduce costs by 50%. It actually increased costs by several hundred percent. So we had about a $600 million launch budget going into that. By the time we finished we were developing the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program, our budget had gone up to three billion dollars a year for launch. So, so you know, we hadn't done ourselves any favors um, by trying to use archaic technology to get to space. When people say, "Hey, how come things aren't better or didn't happen sooner?" This this is why, and yeah, it's, totally. it's it's understandable, even if it's not admirable or it's not the sort of thing that we would like. 
Well, you, you got to understand that people always assume that they're the best managers that ever lived. I mean, you can't tell them how to manage something because they already know. And unfortunately, space launch is the same way. I, I, uh, I recently had someone explain to me that we all ought to be using solid rocket motors to do space launch because they're more responsive. And I am just biting my tongue because there's no point in telling this guy who was a customer that this was not a very good idea, you know, not just from the environmental impact, but from the impact of satellites and programs and everything else. People have preconceived notions of what's the right answer, and they tend to be biased that way. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. So, all right. So we get through DCX, gets moved over to NASA. You fly some more you're showing that it's possible, um, you're getting press and attention and the, the community, uh, you know, there are people that are not in the agencies, uh, not in the government, helping, running support, talking to members of Congress and making sure that the arguments are being, are getting made. Eventually the gig is up, right? So, what what's the wind down of DCX and then? Well, we we uh, as I mentioned, we got 105 million dollars uh, over four years. I think uh, in '94 we got 35 million, '95 25 million, in '96 uh, uh, we got 15 million, and then '97 I think we got 10 million. We added up to 105. So you know, Congress was trying to push the DoD to go do something that made sense. And and in fairness to General Mormon, when he recommended that we go do ELV, he said we should also spend fifty million dollars a year on reusable launch technology. We just never did. There was a lot of intermediate lack of leadership that drove that. Uh, it should have happened. It was kind of a no-brainer. Uh, but it's uh, maybe it's for the best because what ultimately happened was the commercial sector has taken off, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and the rest of them. And yeah. they are rapidly moving down this path of reusable launch. But I do hope that we continue to incentivize and motivate those companies to continue building hardware and flying. Did Elon, was Elon there when you guys shut down and locked the door and you just tossed the keys to him? Or what was the... Oh, that was, was... That was later. He started his SpaceX right. venture in... Uh, I think it was around 2001 or 2002, somewhere in there. And were and, you involved uh, in trying to Yeah, take I was. I, I was uh, helping out DARPA, and we were uh, funding. DARPA was funding their early uh, Falcon 1 launches. In fact, they funded the first three launches. So, uh, And I was uh, out there, you know, helping where I could. And, and I remember the first time I met Elon, he knew, must have known something about my background because he corners me and he starts asking all these questions about really deep technical questions about ramjets and scramjets and rockets and what's the right way to go when he starts talking dynamic pressure and thermal heating. And, and I'm just sitting there amazed because he's practically quoting the brief I've got. So he, 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 you know, people think he shoots from the hip. That kid does not shoot from the hip, and I know he's not a kid anymore. But <laughs> he he, he wow. does not shoot from the hip. He thinks these things through very carefully and very smartly. And uh, you know, you, you definitely want to keep Elon at the helm of uh, of SpaceX, along with Gwen. She does a great job. So they, they're all, uh, you know, pursuing this next generation. And and if you look at Starship, pretty close to what we were thinking of for Delta Clipper. You know, it was a takes off vertically, it re-enters nose first, it rotates and lands. Um, so, you know, all of that. This has been phenomenal. And I, I, I have picked up some more of the pieces here as I am doing this sort of exploration. Uh, for those who are watching this that maybe had, maybe had heard of DCX, maybe hadn't, um, what, as you look kind of at what you have done in your career and then recommending things for this this next set are there suggestions key insights something you would like to recommend to our uh absolutely future it's all about aircraft-like operability we, we demonstrated on dcx a 26 hour turnaround time due to a monsoon storm that came in and slowed us down from the eight hour goal we could have gotten the eight hour goal 
Uh, I had a, a great story. White Sands Missile Range calls me up after we had done the 26-hour turnaround and says, I got to call off Pete Conrad, you know, Apollo 12 and Skylab commander, because he's inciting a, re a rebellion down here. He wants to fly three times in the day. What do these guys think I'm going to do? I'm, I'm this poor lieutenant colonel on the air staff. I, I'm not about to call up the third guy to walk on the moon and tell him not to, uh, you know, advocate launching three times in the day. Now, we never did it, but there was a money constraint, nothing else. But we, yeah, we absolutely could have done that. And there's no reason why you can't turn these vehicles around in a couple of hours. And there's no reason why you can't responsibly launch them in under an hour and potentially within minutes. And I got lots of stories on that as well. So the key, though, is for the next generation of entrepreneurs, focus on rapid turnaround. Because aircraft, are very, very expensive on a per flight basis if you don't fly them very often. Yeah. But if you fly them a lot, they're very, very cheap to fly. If, if someone is maybe not that entrepreneur themselves, but they still want to be supportive, is there, like, is there value in the support that people can give that help, like, you know, the people, the <laughs> lieutenant colonel who is now maybe working on some uh, new project, support worthwhile? It can be. Uh, it, it, it can be harmful, too. So it just depends on the particular project. OK, uh, I would say, uh, you know, talk to those people and see what makes sense. So, talk to them, yeah. you know, I mean, the, the reason DCF kind of took off is it had this tremendous commercial potential, not just it's kind of the uh, epitome of the way star trek started you know the mm -hmm. the enterprise is the long-term goal to be able to do all kinds of crazy things in the future but if you can't get to space you can't do anything so you really have an advantage there and i would encourage people to continue to push that advantage uh, the nasa cots program has been phenomenal in terms of uh i personally think we ought to jump on board with elon and say we're going to be on mars in the next six well six years and make it happen okay and if we have to spend a few billion dollars so what you know go do it and mars is only one of many destinations if you can get to mars you can get to the asteroid belt if you can get to mars you can get to anywhere in cisplender space you know a lot of things that you can do high school you just showed up again wait yeah. wait a way to bookend it like yeah all right we are finally getting to the point where this thing that i was thinking about is is possible um jess uh you know, and I know that we are leaving a huge chunk of your career and other things that you have done out of this conversation. But I really appreciate taking the time to talk about DCX and your journey, your personal journey, uh, and, and how that contributed so much to this phenomenal uh, world that exists today. Um, thank you again, and uh, hopefully, You'll be willing to share some more stories with us again at some point here in the future. Anytime, Sean. I sure enjoyed it. Awesome. Hey, Sean. Hey there. How's things? Good. Good. It's always interesting to begin after, you know, having a conversation and then go back and listen to the things again. So, um, you know, obviously Jess is very well known in the industry. Um, and, you know, personally, I was born into the DCX extended family right, yeah. into the industry. Uh, yeah, you, you have direct experience from um, and, you reusable, know, reusable rocketry. That's in your blood, yeah. That's, you know, Dave Mastin's air, airplane-like operations was huh? a critical piece, and we did it. Um, and it wasn't until a little later that I started to realize that this was so revolutionary. Um, yeah. But the the path that Jess and the program had to go through to get there uh, was still kind of unknown to me. 
So yeah. what did you, did you find some things out that were new <laughs> that resonated with you? Um, I did, but not the things I expected. I, uh, while he was going through his alphabet soup, at some point he referenced the uh, Air Force Institute of Technology. And I'm like, what's that? Wait a second. I know a lot about the Air Force education program and somehow I had utterly missed it. So I spent uh, I spent a couple rabbit rabbit hole minutes uh, looking up the Air Force Institute of Technology, which I had never heard of before. So that's a super, super like in the weeds detail. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, you know, uh, the thing that struck me, this is, you know, this is now the second time I've heard it. Uh, the takeaway is the politics matters, oh, God, yeah. um, right? Uh, whether it's whether it's a lieutenant colonel trying to uh, say no to uh, to an astronaut general, um, or whether it's funding or whether it's this sort of funding or that sort of funding and we get a little bit of progress and then take a step back and a little bit more progress. And, and it is out of proportion to the dollars that are involved. Like yeah. the space efforts have required much, much more political work than you would think as a percentage of the overall federal budget, this space stuff is a tiny, tiny, yeah. tiny, tiny piece. And yet the vice president's getting involved here. And you got like, it's, mm -hmm. it is um, very notable the weight that these space efforts require. And it's not just to get dollars. It is also to get permission to get, top cover um and that political cost has definitely come down thanks to all of these efforts yeah. but it has not come close to zero no no but also remember you know vice presidents are getting involved because the media is getting involved yeah. that there's a larger story i mean um uh I, I, a retired Air Force Colonel, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Garrison, he refers to it as budget dust, yeah. right? It's so small in the scope of everything else. Uh, if if all of NASA is what, 0.3% of the national expendable budget, um, 0.03, sorry, 0.03. It would be great if it was 0.3. Yeah. Um, um, uh, you know, and, and then if you look at a program like DCX, you know, they're talking, okay, a couple hundred million dollars, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, that, that is an, not an insignificant amount of money, yeah. but not at the level of getting a vice president involved, not in the level of getting, you know, fist fights at NASA or the air force over. So, yeah. um, yeah. But, but once again, you hear our stories about people volunteering, people showing up. Mm -hmm. you know, we've heard the DCX story from a couple of different perspectives already. This is obviously the straight down the, the middle one. But it's notable that this program in particular needed a lot of support from outside, from inside, from mm -hmm. up and down and left and right. And while that DCX vehicle did not go above the Carmen line, it is the the grandfather. It's the grandfather. All the Everybody traces their lineage from, yeah. from it. And yeah. this, is, uh, this is not jess or the foundation or anyone trying to like take take credit after the fact this is the real deal like there isn't another one of these things and if you look at the the concept of reuse that we had with shuttle 
and the concept of reuse that we had with DCX, you see which one is, it, at least at the moment, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe there will be shuttle, uh, shuttle clan will be coming back. You know, we'll see Sierra space may be able to get dream chaser to that level. Like there, there are still other possibilities, but yeah. for right now, um, vertical takeoff, vertical landing reuse seems to be the thing. And this was, you know, 20 plus 30 years ago. I, I know you know him better than just this show. Yeah. Um, uh, his comment and somebody from the, from the audience, I don't know who this is, uh, uh, New frontier airspace. Um, they they took down this quote, and I, and I thought, oh, that that quote is right on track, right? Yeah. Uh, if you want to figure out how to how to fight wars in the future, sometimes it's better not to ask the people who fought wars in the past. Uh, as a former U.S. Marine, I a hundred hundred percent agree with that. Uh, that's you know that's often that we're always fighting the last war yeah. is kind of the, and, and in this case, you know, space is not war, but it is still a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's not a person versus person political challenge, but it is person versus nature, you know, gravity as <laughs> nature. Right. Um, and, you know, the engineering is, you know the numbers are the numbers um you got to find ways to work around that so you know there are a lot of people that believe things very strongly and i will say overall it's very difficult for people to keep in their mind that there might be multiple solutions that are will work and can be correct um and when we lose ourselves in a religious debate it can get tough to realize, okay, we can go this way or we can go that way and be successful. What we can't do is just argue about it. Right, right, right. <laughs> that focus on the action. Um, make the best decision you've got with the information that's available, information. pick a course and go run it down. Um, yeah. And Jess has done that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Many times over. Uh, you know, I... I don't know what's next for him. And one of the things that I'm finding as we do these interviews, this is now, I think, the this is the fifth one, fourth one that we've made public. We've got a yeah. set of 10 and we've got another set of 10 after that. Um, one of the things I keep thinking about as we close out the show is what's next, right? So I want to go chase these folks down and get the next piece of their story because because we're really focusing on a very specific yeah. period of time in these in these uh, pioneers interviews. Yeah. Uh, that, and I yeah. actually I I was wondering afterwards like what what what's he doing these days? Like I don't actually know the answer to that I'm going to have to look that up. So I have some ideas of what he's what he's doing now, but like just because. And DCX was successful and then died doesn't mean that it's over. There right. are more iterations in the chain to come. Yeah. Yeah. And more in the exploration of the eighties and nineties still to yep. come as well. So, yep. Uh, give us a commercial. What's coming up next for uh, the pioneer series and what's well, coming up got next for the several foundation? Yeah, several more uh, interviews that we've got still in this kind of first series that uh, we've we've got to present uh, and to share. Um, and so coming up, there will be some stories about uh, space stations. There'll be some stories about astronauts. Okay. Uh, there'll be some telling of tales uh, about the Intrepid, um, again, from a couple different perspectives and a whole lot of different perspectives around the same sort of event, but people will get a good sense of these were normal as normal people, right. you know, 
Okay, there were some eccentrics. And but there's also, I was going to say. There, there's some normals. Like, there's some some wealthy people and some people of zero means. Right. Um, and that what we have today doesn't come just from multiple PhD holders uh, in, in flight suits and lab coats and that sort of stuff. Um, there's These are real people. Um, and they have done some real work and it's an, I know, hopefully going to inspire more folks to pick up the, the flag and carry it forward again. The, the biggest, the absolute single biggest fact that I learned, uh, you know, that was a surprise to me of all of these interviews is that uh, in a very personal way, uh, I'm in space because somebody got high with, uh, with uh, Timothy Leary. Right. Like, wait, what? Yeah. So yeah. definitely stick, stay tuned for that. And then also um, the first of the uh, Spotify. Yeah. Uh, so uh, folks, thank you. Uh, if folks are watching and listening to this and like want to get it again while you're on your morning commute or your jog or whatever, um, we're taking this series now on to the audio podcast realm. So you can catch it on Spotify and Amazon Music and Apple podcasts and wherever fine podcasts are stored and distributed. Um, so we're spreading these out there as well. So if you miss something or you want to listen to it again, you can speed it up and slow it down or whatever, <laughs> whatever works um, to kind of extract some more lessons out of these conversations. Right. Okay. Uh, and I'll see you next week. Next week. Uh, thanks very much. All righty. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye-bye.